<laughs> you see, I sat on the sofa again. It's just, yeah. Or is it just me? I, no, I, I do think I look a little bit different to you three. Yes, like, yeah. I'm bald, basically. But just, Zach, uh, Jack, Ben and I could be the, the same sofa. person. <laughs> yeah. You're like identical. <laughs>
underreported aspect of US foreign policy at the moment, what they're doing in Latin America rather than, you know, the Middle East and the Asia Pacific and elsewhere. Yeah, I think it's really interesting because there's a very popular meme, isn't there, in like not just like political discourse, but like internet culture, yeah. that foreign and American intervention is necessarily a bad yeah. thing. It's a form of sort of interference, essentially. Um, and th there's obviously reason to think that. I mean, Iraq and in a way the Middle East, although I think that picture is more complicated because in some sense we might consider the chaos that's happening in the Middle East as, as sort of a symptom of the fact of the American withdrawal mm. from the Middle East. Um, but it's this is in part due to selection bias, isn't it? In that we remember the catastrophic examples, yeah. we remember the Afghanistans and we remember the Iraqs, but we don't remember what we might consider like the successful interventions. Mm. I mean, the Guatemala, for example, is a great example, but you know, before Iraq and Afghanistan, you had the, the sort of Balkan crisis um, and uh, the American-led intervention there is widely considered a bit of a success. Um, and the first Gulf War. But anyway, the I think an interesting little tidbit on this is I think it's, I'm right in saying that the Guatemalan um, sort of right-wing military dictatorship that was around in the 60s and 70s um, became good mates with Israel at the time. Mm. And they were cooperating on basically how to combat counterinsurgency yeah. operations, uh, combat insurgency operations, or counterinsurgency operations. Um, and it's one of the reasons Guatemala was originally one of the very few countries to vote with Israel at the first couple oh, okay. of uh, UN General yeah. Assembly votes. I think I'm right in saying that. I hope that's true. Um, anyway, that's, that's, that's a good fun one. Mm. Uh, and yeah, I, I think that that's true, that in general, good news like that does just sort of get overlooked. And that's yeah. just a function of the way the media works. Um, my unreported story is a bit closer to home, but that's exotic. Um, and it relates to a story that only really happened a couple of hours ago. We were recording this on Wednesday at about like 2 p.m. And it was Macron announcing a whole load of policies. Mm. And I think the most interesting one was he, he announced a whole load of pro-natalist policies to try and stimulate the French birth rate. I think the word to use was he wants a demographic rearmament, which is a very Macron-like turn <laughs> yeah. of phrase. I'm yeah. going to miss him when he goes. I really <laughs> am. Um, I think it's interesting for a couple of reasons. One, I think it's interesting that it's even France has a self-acknowledged demographic crisis. France has typically had a higher than mm. average birth rate for developed countries. It's hovered about 1.6, 1.7. Uh, that's about 0.2 above the EU average, and it's about 0.3 above places like Germany or the UK. Um, and, yeah, so I think it's interesting because even France is, is having this crisis because in the last, like, year or so, the birth number of births has dropped by something like 10%. The, the fertility rate has probably fallen to something more like 1.5, maybe a bit above that. But it's quite a steep decline in a year, so it's, it's a worrying sign for France. But I think it's part of this more general trend, which is the like politicization of demography mm. and fertility in in Europe, in the developed world. You know, you see this obviously uh, in Italy with Maloney, who's promising to reverse what she describes as Italy's demographic winter. Um, you see signs of it in, in other European countries like Spain, for example, which also has a very low fertility rate, and as does Portugal. Um, and I think it's really interesting because the, it's one of these things, one of these problems that at first glance looks very, very insurmountable. I mean, A, the, the maths looks irrefutable. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have basically a fertility rate below 2.1, which was what you need to keep your population pyramid stable, basically the same shape, so you have the same ratio of old people to young people, um, then you just end up with an ever-aging population. Um, and the other reason it's, it's very, very difficult is because the traditional policy solutions just haven't really worked. You know, like I think Macron has included some of these in his recent policy announcement. Stuff like increasing maternity and paternity leave just doesn't really work. Mm. Or um, making it like more flexible hour contract stuff, um, making it childcare cheaper, using state provision to provide certain childcare things. Um, none of these really seem to work. I mean, the best example here is Sweden, um, which has very, very generous paternity and maternity leave. And it looks like Sweden's fertility rate is slightly stimulated from that. Sweden has fertility rate right, like 1.7, something like that, basically along the French line. Mm -hmm. um, and Poland, again, Poland has a very generous, now quite famous uh, sort of scheme in Poland. I can't remember what it's called, but it basically involves giving the equivalent of a few hundred euros a month for every child you have. And you receive that until you the child turns 18. Oh, wow. yeah, yeah, so it's very, very simple, very, very comprehensive scheme. It was introduced, I think, by the law and justice government, but it has been continued... I'm pretty sure I'm right in saying by Tusk. Um, but none of these seem to have a sufficient impact. Like they never get the fertility rate back up to like 2.1. Um, and that leads to this really difficult conundrum for at least at first glance for European policymakers in that, you know, it looks like the maths is irrefutable and the obvious policy solutions are ineffective. What do we do? But I just think there's something like oddly ahistoric about this. Like population has been getting older for years. Mm. 
And we've never considered a problem. In fact, we've always considered it a sign of progress. You know, life expectancy goes up yeah. and we don't have like a million kids to labor on our farms. We consider that a sign of progress. Or we have done until very, very recently. And it's the discourse really started changing about like, I'd say about two decades ago when all of a sudden the discourse about overpopulation shifts to discourse about underpopulation yeah. or like aging societies. And it's a really ahistoric shift. You know what I mean? When you like yeah. zoom out, there's something like fundamentally weird about worrying about the reverse of overpopulation yeah. or worrying specifically about like an aging population. We've always thought aging was a good thing. Um, I think there's two things to say about this. One, I think, so, so basically I think there's two ways to solve this problem. One is to completely rethink how we think about aging. One of the reasons this is such a difficult, oh, this is such a long story, but I just going to do it. One of the reasons that we think it's a problem is because obviously the pension age is just set 65 or somewhere along those lines in most of Europe and most in America as well. Um, and we just sort of consider anything above 65 to be old. And it's worth noting that, that the 65 number is, is very much a modern contingency. The 65 number, I think, is introduced in the UK by Attlee, and he actually revised it down from 70, which is what it was in 1898 when the first like pension mm. act is introduced. Um, and so, like, but the, the fact that the pensions come in at 70 in 1898, and the idea of pushing them back up to 70 now, when life expectancy is 20 years more mm. than what it used to be in 1898, would be like political suicide, does tell you something about like how uh, how contingent that 65 number is. So I think the first solution is to, to, to basically shift the pension age to make it so that the pension age is probably relative to life expectancy. That would be very politically unpopular, but mm. it would sort of be a solution. But the other thing is to focus on the, like uh, public policy, public policies and healthcare that improves not just lifespan, but also like health span, yeah. like making sure people are healthy for longer and therefore like able to work for longer. Um, and I also, the last thing I'll say is I think it forces governments to fo fix more structural problems in the economy. Like it turns out that you can't just provide very generous paternity and maternity leave. You want people to have kids. You have to solve stuff like the housing crisis. Yeah. Like you have to solve stuff like stagnant wages. You have to basically give people a sense of optimism and enough disposable capital that they can afford to have kids or they have the confidence to have kids. Um, so that is my, just a tiny little underreported story for you guys. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, the main story today, we're going to be talking about the constant series of escalations we're seeing, not just in the Middle East, um, but across the world. So I think the most obvious example here is what we've seen in the past couple of days vis-a-vis -vis Iran. So Iran has sent missiles into Pakistan and Iraq. It claims to have attacked basically as, as, the most of the targets were related to ISIS and other Pakistani terrorist groups. So the ISIS one was in Iraq, and then obviously mm -hmm. Pakistani terrorists. They groups. hit Syria as well, I, th I think, on the same in, day they hit Iraq. I think they did hit Damascus. The same yeah. um, but then there's also, the, well, at least the Iranians claim to have hit what they describe as a Mossad stronghold mm. in Iraq, in the city of Erbil, which is controlled by the Kurds. And that Mossad stronghold was allegedly sort of between the US consulate in Erbil and Erbil Airport, which is like a, it's basically a US base, like it's controlled and operated by US troops. Um, this is the first direct involvement we've seen from Iran so far. And the, before that, obviously Iran's proxies had been causing a bit of chaos in the Middle East. You had the Houthis disrupting shipping and you had Hezbollah trading missile strikes with um, Israel in Southern Lebanon. But the Iranians had refrained from direct involvement. And this is the first direct involvement. Even though there were no Israeli or American casualties, this is the first sort of direct involvement we've had from Iran so far. So basically the big question here, Rory, is how worried should we be? You know, where is this going? Yeah, well, I was more worried when, so when the initial news came out about Iran striking um, Erbil in, in Iraq, uh, it was initially reported as Iran targets uh, U.S. consulate and U.S. Oh, yeah. troops, and yeah. I thought, oh, this is this is bad. <laughs> um, but fortunately, it wasn't, you know, quite that um, quite that bad. I mean, it's still still a pretty major um, major thing to happen. But um, yeah, you know, with a bit of time and and more more details and more, more news coming out, it wasn't quite what we initially thought. But um, I think what's interesting, and you pointed this out, is that Iran is the, the places that Iran has struck. They haven't. T they're not targeting these national governments. They're targeting you know militant groups yeah. or terrorist groups or whatever they might might describe them as and that's sort of the same as what the u.s is doing the u.s and the uk you know that they're, they're striking houthi military outposts they're not they they the uk and u.s would say we're not striking yemen we're striking yeah the houthis and the u.s have just redesignated the houthis as a terrorist yeah, organization exactly yeah. israel also is 
would probably say we're striking Hezbollah. We're not striking Lebanon. I mean, you know, geographically speaking, obviously they are. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so so you've got the situation where these countries are, there's not like an interstate warfare going on or interstate no. kind of um, shootout going on. But even just with states attacking what they would call terrorist groups or militant groups, that every every rocket that gets fired is just another kind of <laughs> chance for, a, for yeah. an accident or for an escalation to happen. Um, so I think that is the real risk here. And also the other danger is that all the all the important players in this are saying they don't want to escalate and they don't want things to kind of get out of hand. But I think maybe apart from the Israelis, yes, I think it's worth yeah, mentioning caveat that's, there. That's yeah. fair. Um, but it's entirely possible for things to escalate even if all the important actors say they don't want things to escalate. Like yeah. it's all... I don't want to say it's out of anyone's control because, you know, that's probably too deterministic or whatever, but, um, or fatalistic, but, uh, yeah, it is a dangerous situation because you can have all the intention of not escalating things and, it's, and it still can happen, yeah, which is so pretty I, terrifying thought. I, I think that's, the, that's the, basically the entirely the correct way of looking at it. You, you want to look at what the intentions are mm. amongst the big actors. And I think you're completely right. The U S definitely doesn't actually want escalation. Yeah. I think the U S is in, as they see it, at least, I don't know if this is a justifiable, but they would describe their strikes as de-escalatory. They're trying to yeah. de-escalate yeah. via deterrence, essentially. Um, I also think, by the way, that's true of the Iranians. Uh, I think Iran is in just a far weaker state than most people think it is. Um, people think that Iran is a sort of like regional troublemaker and that it's maybe deliberately pushing the Houthis, Hamas, Hezbollah to sort of provoke Israel into a wider regional war. I don't think that's the right read on things. I mean, it's very hard to read things, not just because obviously Iran is hard to get a read on, mm. but also because there are sort of different groups within the Iranian state who have different like intentions. Um, but I really do think that Iran is in a very weak position. It just simply can't afford a war with Israel. I mean, mm. Iran's economy is, is a mess right now, has been since the Trump reimposed sanctions in 2018. Politically, the, the Iranian regime is deeply, deeply unpopular um, as demonstrated by the protests. That happened last year. I mean, I know they've died down, but that doesn't mean that the sort of uh, median Iranians yeah. changed their mind on the regime. That, in, by, by, in part, by the way, is just a function of the fact that the current Iranian administration, led by Ibrahim Raisi, is just super incompetent. Mm. Like, they're, they're, they're a terrible economic manager. And, and that just makes people angry, especially yeah. when there's no democratic outlet um, to, to sort of express that discontent. Because Iran used to have a sort of controlled democracy until about 2009, I think. Um, maybe 2008, when they basically started rigging the presidential election and saying that you can only vote for a very select number of candidates. Um, but then finally, again, I think this is sort of under, it's just underestimated, it's, it's underreported. The current leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, is getting old. Yeah. And he, there's a massive succession crisis because the, he hasn't uh, nominated deputy, who would be the obvious candidate. The next most obvious candidate is Raisi, but Raisi is super unpopular and probably too much of a hardliner for your median Iranian, or like the Iranian public. Mm. Um, and there's been some rumors that he's grooming one of his sons for the position. Yeah. But that, I mean, that is just like <laughs> insane. I mean, I don't think he remembers what happened in 1979, which he was a big part of, by mm. the way, which is when uh, Iranian dynasty, a family dynasty was overthrown <laughs> for being like corrupt and inept. Yeah. Um, or that, maybe that's an unfair description of the Reza Shah, the, the whole Shah dynasty. But anyway, whatever. The, um, yeah, so I mean, that would be immensely risky. Uh, and I just think that with that, there's an economic crisis, a crisis of legitimacy, and then there's the succession, coming succession crisis. Iran just doesn't have the... It can't afford to go to war with Israel. Um, and I think you already saw that in the past couple of years when Iran has been desperately trying to normalise relationships yeah. with Saudi Arabia. I mean, that is a symptom of its vulnerability. It's doing that because it knows it can no longer afford to fight these very costly proxy wars when it's got such a uh, sort of furious public at home. Um, there was a very telling sign, by the way. It's very hard to gauge Iranian public opinion, but... There's an Iranian football match in Tehran a couple of weeks ago, and um, someone brought out a Palestinian flag. Mm. And then, you know, again, it's hard to gauge public opinion. I don't know how I was into this, but they, they're basically chanting in, in Farsi, you can shove that flag up your arse. <laughs> because from the Iranian position, from the Iranian public's position, you know, they are living, their, their poverty rate has doubled in 10 years. Uh, GDP per capita is about $4,000. Mm. But by the way, that's like half what it was in 2012. That's about like a third of what it was in 1990. Um, and yet their state is funneling billions and billions yeah. of dollars to all of these various proxy groups. I mean, if you were an ordinary Iranian, you'd just be grumpy about that. Yeah. You'd be grumpy about the fact that your, your, your government is prioritizing foreign proxy groups uh, over your sort of domestic prosperity. Um, 
so yeah, I basically think that Iran can't afford a war and it really doesn't want a war. And I do think you see that in its like its statements and its behavior and the fact that these strikes are sort of like the minimum sufficient deterrence. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I'll say is that people often say like, oh, that can't be true. Look at what the Houthis are doing or look at what Hamas is doing. I think it's worth saying that both Hamas and the Houthis have far more independence from Iran, far more agency than, than most people assume. Again, yeah. this is this is, depends on your reading of like Iranian politics and who you trust. But that's the read on it. And the, the group that has the least independence is Hezbollah. The group mm. with the longest like, and deepest ties to the Iranian state is Hezbollah. And that's like the original Iranian proxy. In fact, the success of Hezbollah is basically what inspired Iran to go on and fund this network yeah. of proxy groups. Um, and Hezbollah have been conspicuously quiet. And that is the strongest indication of where what Iran's position on this is. And I do think that actually the Houthis, uh, it's, it's, it's probably that, like, I don't know how much it's directed by Iran and it could plausibly, essentially an independent decision yeah. by the Houthis to disrupt maritime shipping. And it's both because they've seen like a political vacuum, they get to sort of represent the Palestinian mm. cause in the, in the Arab world. Uh, and also because the Houthis have, have got their own domestic issues and this is a very good distraction from them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I basically think Iran doesn't want war. The Americans definitely don't want war. I mean, it's the last thing Biden wants. Um, I do think the one exception is, is probably the Israelis because some of the rhetoric coming from Israeli officials suggests that they are looking to escalate, especially against Hezbollah in, in southern Lebanon. And I think that's for understandable security anxieties. You know, it's, they, they're just worried about the Hamas-style attack on it's from southern Lebanon at some point. So they sort of feel the need to like purge that area mm. of, of like um, opposition groups. Opposition groups probably understatement description <laughs> yeah. of a Hezbollah. But the, yeah, so th that's the only exception to that. But I think that even if you're right, even if most groups don't want war, the fact that the Israelis in some sense maybe do, or at least they're more enthusiastic about a war with Hezbollah than other people are, it is worrying. But I also think, and you probably know more about this than I do, there are other groups who do want war, other states as well, who who do sort of want war and who are looking to capitalise on the current geopolitical instability to advance their own sort of like strategic aims. And I think another good example of this we had recently is North Korea. Yeah. So what is it? Today they basically said that they no yeah, longer believe in reunification. Was, yes, well, depending on when people are watching this, it was sometime this week. Uh, yeah. this week. Um, Kim Jong-un gave a big speech to their, uh, I think it's called the Supreme People's Assembly or something like that. Um, and he effectively said, um, we no longer see peaceful reconciliation and unification as an option. We are now two distinct countries and South Korea is our principal enemy. And, you know, if we need to prepare for war, well, we are preparing for war and we need to, and we need to continue doing so. Um, and that's a real, you know, despite all the, all the tension and conflict between the two Koreas in, well, since the Korean war in the fifties, the, the, there has been this shared belief by held by, um, Kim Jong-un's father and grandfather that the people of North and South Korea are, you know, the same from the same people and, you know, further, much further down the line, eventual peaceful reunification is kind of the shared goal of both North and South Korea. Um, it doesn't, it hasn't always looked like that's been, you know, their goal, but that has kind of been the stated goal. Um, but Kim Jong-un kind of just ripped that up this week and said, no, that's not happening. We've got to prepare for, you know, the reality that we might go to war and it's, you know, peaceful reunification is, is a myth effectively. So he's shut down or he's ordered the shutting down of some inter-Korean agencies and some, yeah, which um, is always quite worrying. Yeah. And also, wants to change the constitution to explicitly label South Korea as the principal enemy of, of North Korea. And the other thing was, oh, there's a, there's a monument in Pyongyang, which is like dedicated to um, the, the concept of peaceful reunification. It's that gate, isn't it? Is it the yeah, gate? I yeah. think that's, I think he wants to take that down, um, which is pretty symbolic. So, and, th and this comes alongside continued missile tests. Yeah. This is North a pattern escalation yes. in a way, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And then, on the flip side, you've got the US and South Korea and also Japan engaging in joint military drills, which kind of escalates from that side. And, you know, it keeps on keep the bar. Kind well, of it's another example, isn't it? Because I think it's fair to say that, I, don't, I mean, neither Japan nor South Korea really want an escalation no. in that region at all. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I guess the point here in both cases, both the Middle East and around the Pacific, is that actually it doesn't require a majority of like participants no. to want escalation for us to get there. Yeah. In fact, it almost only sort of requires one. And then the other side has to do, you know, engage in sort of 
deterrence escalation yeah. or de-escalation via deterrence, which normally ends up failing and just you get another rung on the escalatory ladder. So I guess there's a sort of a pessimistic end to this segment here. Very. We're just saying that the sufficient condition for escalation is one bellicose party. Um, are you World War Three? <laughs> Pro or anti? <laughs> you, know, you think it's coming? You think uh, we're... I, I don't know. I think there's there'll be some kind of conflict, but you know, labeling something World War Three. Yeah. I feel like everyone's desperate to call something World War Three. They weren't there in. Well, at the start of World War II, think this is World War II. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I'm i not, I don't know. Ever since I naively thought Russia wouldn't invade Ukraine, I'm very wary Same. of guessing what's going to happen. Um, but I do, I think, I'm, I'm optimistic that the situation in the Middle East won't escalate beyond what it is now. You know, rocket fire, for example, between Hezbollah and Israel or, you know, Iran or the US doing what they would call de-escalatory strikes. That I, I, I'm hopeful that it won't go beyond that, but yeah. I, I also can't really see how it all comes to an end. If no. everyone just gets bored, you know? But, yeah, I, that's really not an answer to your question, but I'm <laughs> I'm hopeful and probably leaning towards not World War Three. Well, it's the safe bet, because if yeah. the answer is yes, then we can script it anyway, and no yeah. one can hold us to account. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, the... I think it's, it, there's sort of two competing things here, isn't there? I mean, there's the fact that very few participants in, in either region want further escalation, I mean, yeah. especially the Middle East, it's worth saying. I mean, the statements that come out of Saudi Arabia at the moment are just so cautious. Yeah. You know, even even when there were American-led strikes on the Houthis, who have been like a long-time Saudi enemy, the statement was calling for restraint and urging caution mm. and basically telling the U.S. to de-escalate. Um and it's clear that the, the Saudis, and I think a couple of other Arab states, are still hopeful about normalization with, like, with Israel yeah. later down the line. Um, I do think that the, you know, I, I think that a lot will depend on uh, what happens in southern Lebanon. Mm. Um, but my instinct is actually with you as well. I think there's, we often overstate, like, what I think well, another big thing is we're massively, well, not massively, but a lot of people are overplaying what Iran has done recently. I mean, the strikes that we saw, especially in Iraqi Kurdistan, they're basically identical to strikes we saw in 2022, which mm. was after the Israelis blew up an Iranian oil refinery. The Iranians did target some strikes in Iraqi Kurdistan uh, as a sort of retaliation against what they described as a US base, um, an Israeli base there. And obviously that didn't turn out into World War III. Um, so I do think that it's, you know, we shouldn't overstate what's happened with Iran. And also Iran, it is the major player on the other side of the aisle in the Middle East, mm. you know, it's Israel's sort of main nemesis. And I really, really do think they're just far too weak to have a war. So I think that will calm down eventually. I don't really know how it does. Yeah. Um, but basically, I, I think no to World War Three. So two no's to World War Three. <laughs> That's <laughs> overwhelming. Thank God. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, I think that takes us past the end of that segment. Uh, and we are now going to move on to the fun bit of the podcast, the World Leader Leaderboard. Yeah. Okay, so, Rory, who is going down today? Going down uh, is Xi Jinping. Um, he, uh, actually, I don't know where he is on the board currently. I'll move them in a second. Oh, yeah. So he's going even further down. He's in the negative zone, but going a little bit further down. This is because uh, China has just released uh, data from 2023 for birth rates, and it's continuing a trend of declining, well, a declining population and declining birth rates. So they lost... I think 2.75 million people last year. I say lost. Uh, the population is 2.75 million <laughs> lower than it was the previous year. And that's a much bigger fall than it was in 2022 when it was something like 850,000, yeah. a drop of 850,000. So it's a, it's a much steeper drop. Um, I mean, we talked about birth rates at the start of this. We all know that the problems that are associated with low birth rates, aging population and so on. Um, and that's a pretty major challenge that China is trying to trying to face you know it's recognized as as a real issue there but and they have changed lots of things you know the, the one child policy turned into a two child into a three child policy um but so far well they need four thing, five yeah, six yeah. be fine yeah. so far things don't don't seem to be working no it's, and it's, it's proof that thing we mentioned a while ago which is yeah. that actually you can't solve the fertility crisis just by you know giving cash to parents yeah. or would be parents Again, interacts with that point as well about the housing crisis. I mean, China has one of the most acute housing yeah. crises in the world. And so that almost definitely is suppressing the birth rate in, in lots mm. of ways. Um, one thing I'd also say about China, we talked about this in the start as well, about how sometimes, in, in, well, in a sense, we can be too pessimistic about declining fertility rates. 
there is a reason that action decline fertility rates might be okay for China, um, and that is that it gives your essentially you have fewer laborers in a large co economy. It gives the workers more power. Yeah, um, and you could basically ex that that might push sort of the balance of political power within China away from capital and the government mm. towards like working Chinese households. Um, one of the things that's so uh, sort of unique about the Chinese economy is that consumption makes up a tiny fraction of GDP. So basically Chinese households don't get paid very much, which is one of the reasons they want such massive export surpluses, by the way, because if you underpay your workers, they can't buy the stuff they actually like manufacture. Um, and one of the ways that might change in the future is if the pool of labor gets smaller, then the bargaining power of labor yeah. goes up. And you might expect them to sort of be able to extract a greater share of the wealth, the profits um, from China's like economic production, um, which would be interesting. It, it would make for very different geopolitics because we wouldn't have all those uncomfortable mm. dependencies on China if it wasn't so export dependent. Um, but it would make the Chinese economy more balanced in a traditional sense, yeah. so more like modern Western economies. Um, yeah. Anyway, I think that's an interesting little caveat yeah, in the. Yeah, uh, that's definitely an interesting dynamic. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> in the China fertility crisis. Yeah. Um, so the person going down for me, we're doing down first, aren't we? Yeah, we do down. Yeah. Is Joe Biden. Um, wow. I think for pretty obvious reasons. The one silver lining maybe is that Trump is the candidate and Trump is the least popular possible Republican candidates. Um, but Joe Biden's foreign policy is clearly not working. And his attempts to uh, de-escalate via deterrence in the Middle East and persuade the Israelis to de-escalate as well have been wholly unsuccessful. And we're now basically three months into mm. the Gaza war. And even though we did just say that people can overplay the extent to which things have escalated, things are nonetheless escalating. Um, and that's definitely not what Biden wants. It's so been, yeah. Biden's going down for me. There's been, I mean, we've had weeks, if not months now, of um, news articles where they say, you know, the Biden administration is quietly urging Netanyahu and the Israeli government to scale back. And, you know, the, the obvious approach of the, the US government is that we'll try and do this behind the scenes and use our, our leverage to... to scale back Israel's offensive, but it just clearly hasn't worked. Um, and at some point, you know, are they going to have to decide to stop doing it behind the scenes and start more overtly pushing the Israeli government? But, you know, that, that might not work as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, It's been a pretty bad, bad yeah. result so far. Yeah, I mean, I think that they did that. You saw about a month ago, all of a sudden, the headlines changed from, mm. like, is U.S. privately counseled Israel to do X or privately counseled Israel to de-escalate. You started seeing public statements yeah. from Blinken, from Lloyd Austin, from B Biden. I think Biden warned that they were losing the international yeah. community. Uh, Blinken said they had to do more to protect civilians. Uh, Lloyd Austin said it was heading for strategic defeat, mm. I think, which is pretty pretty stark language, actually. Um, but, yeah, that doesn't seem to have made much of a difference either. No. Um, and I, 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 don't, I don't know. <laughs> I think I mean, it's, it's tough news for the Americans. Yeah. But I think, in a sense, it should be unsurprising... Netanyahu, for almost domestic political reasons, uh, just doesn't have he doesn't have the political space um, to make those sort of concessions because he, he will, he's desperately trying to hang on, hang, on, yeah, hang on to power, and he does just rely on the support of some more right wing, very hawkish ministers mm. for his coalition to stay together. So he's always going to have to basically follow their line or anything. And it's also worth saying that actually, even like you might describe as moderate opinion in Israel, is still pretty bellicose. I mean. The idea, for example, that the only thing stopping Israel from de-escalating is Netanyahu is just a historic. Mm. It, it's just um, it doesn't match the facts. Like the most likely successor to Netanyahu would be Benny Gantz, and Benny Gantz was seen as more moderate, especially before the war. Um, but his rhetoric is pretty bellicose yeah, as well. And he's in a unity government. Yeah, he's currently now, in the unity, unity cabinet, government. Um, and he's the most popular politician in Israel. Mm. He would almost definitely win an election if it was held today. Um, but he says some pretty hawkish stuff, uh, not just about Gaza, but also southern Lebanon. Mm. And it's just a reflection of where the median Israeli is uh, politically. Yeah. So that's that. Got to Who move some people is, up. Yeah. Who's going up? Yeah. Go for the, um, the fun bit. Well, with Biden going down, I'm going to move Donald Trump uh, up. Uh, kind of obvious reasons. He won the Iowa caucus fairly, fairly convincingly. Um, and the fact that neither Nikki Haley or Ron DeSantis really kind of secured their place as like the challenger to him yeah it means neither of them are going to drop out yet um so they'll continue splitting that kind of slightly anti-trump vote so he's uh, yeah he's sort of cementing 
cemented his place as the Republican nominee for now. I think it has. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is just, it's not a hot take. And I don't even think it's partisan to say it. It's very depressing that it's Biden, Trump, 2024, yeah. isn't it? It's it, it's dystopian and extreme. I yeah. think sometimes you forget because, you know, this is our era, so we forget how fucking weird it is. But <laughs> it's just obscene that that's going to be the, the rerun. Anyway, uh, that's that. That's that. Whatever. Uh, my person going up, and I've changed it at the last minute because I think it's a good story that we haven't really talked about, is actually Lula. Okay. It's going up for basically economic reasons. Yeah. Uh, Brazil, a lot of emerging markets are really struggling at the moment. They're basically running trade deficits. They're importing more than they export. Brazil is the exception. Brazil is running an enormous, unprecedented trade surplus, and its GDP is about, I think it's 9% above the pre-pandemic trend. It's the highest, biggest difference in the world. So if you look at a graph of Brazilian GDP, it goes like quite flat under Bolsonaro, and then it dips down, and then it shoots up. And that is in part because uh, Brazil has not only the, the natural resources and the minerals that are required for the energy transition and are therefore in higher demand at the moment, but also has the institutions to sort of export them effectively, which, which makes an outlier in Latin America. Yeah. I think that Latin America struggles with not the resources itself, but the sort of institutions, the political framework, the, the like economic base to extract those minerals successfully. Um, and that's great. This is very reminiscent of the first Lula premiership when a similar commodities boom, you know, basically allowed him to afford all of those yeah. famous welfare programs that made him so popular the first time around. So Lula, I think he's having a good time. I should have done that while you were speaking, to be fair. <laughs> so for those who are listening, uh, Lula is now on the very top rung alongside Keir Starmer and Vladimir Putin. Slightly odd bunch. Um, and yeah, Biden and Xi Jinping now down to the second lowest rung with Justin Trudeau. Uh, and then we've got, you can see it now, Sunak, Zelensky, Schultz and Kishida right at the bottom. Can't move any further down. Just just watch it. Go on YouTube. Yeah. This is, this is chaos. Um, okay. I think that is everything. Uh, if you're happy, have you got anything else? Very happy. You're very happy? Yeah. Good. Okay. Well, that is everything. Thank you very much for watching and we'll see you again, reminder, here on TLDR Podcast, not on TLDR Global, next week. Thank you for watching and yeah, see you again.